What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. Okay, so we are covering Dark Days, the casting, as part of our lead up to Dark Knight's Metal. Now, for those of you guys who want to get caught up, or those of you guys who uh, feel a little left out, or you're trying to figure out everything that's going on, if you're new here to my channel, uh, you will find down in the description a playlist that will have most everything you need to be able to understand everything that's going on right now with regards to Dark Days and Dark Knight's Metal and all that kind of good stuff. And I'll also post that playlist at the top of the, uh, the front of my YouTube channel, so you guys shouldn't have a hard time finding it. But the story of the casting is huge. And here's the crazy thing, reading this story, I felt a lot like Alice in Wonderland tumbling down the rabbit hole. And that's what this story feels like to me, because if you understand what you're looking for, or if you've been reading DC for a pretty good amount of time, there are a lot of Easter eggs in this story, Dark Days the Casting, none more so than what we get right off the bat. Remember, in our video on the Forge, we had talked about how the Forge story basically just introduced the notion of Nth Metal, or at least it expanded on it. Nth Metal had been around for a long time, but it was never really anything DC had delved into. They never really offered an explanation on it. It was just a metal that exists out there, and it was as ambiguous as it was was obscure in the realm of DC Comics, and so the result is that Dark Days the Forge began to expand on this, and it started following the story of a guy named Carter Hall. But Carter Hall was the original uh, Hawkman, all the way back in the day, you know, way back when the character first showed up. And over the course of DC's publication history, his stories waxed and waned, but the idea is that Hawkman basically is reborn in a new body every time he dies. And so because of that, what the Forge did is it came back and it introduced the idea that Carter Hall had basically been introduced to Nth Metal, this basis behind the various powers that he has and what he's capable of doing. But it also sent him tumbling down this rabbit hole of trying to figure out what Nth Metal was, why it was powerful, why aliens had crash landed on his uh, on, a, on, you know, on their home planet, introducing Nth Metal in the first place. And so what this does is it basically creates a gathering of sorts. Now this happens near the dawn of the 20th century. And something that I hope you notice here is that the descriptions that we get identify with the individuals who are here. For example, the rhyming, dra uh, the rhyming demon of Camelot, that's Etrigan from the just the DC, you know, sorceries and all that kind of stuff. The brothers who keep secrets and mysteries, that's Cain and Abel. And that's huge because Cain and Abel are part of the religious pantheon. They're part of Vertigo. You know, when it comes to things like a man as old as America, that's Uncle Sam. He's a character that hasn't appeared, at least not that I'm aware of, since before the New 52, since just after, you know, Infinite Crisis and so on. The sorcerers, you know, Shining Knights, the cavemen, that's a reference to the Immortal Man and Vandal Savage, Phantom Strangers. This is basically a veritable who's who of individuals individuals who have been brought together by Carter Hall. And the reason for this is because of the fact that Carter Hall's trying to get an answer to the question, what is Nth Metal and why is it so powerful? We also end up seeing things like the Dagger of Shazam. We'll actually see that, you know, a little more here in a, here in a bit once we get into that discussion. But the other half of this is that where the whole aspect of Carter Hall trying to track down the, the basis and the nature of Nth Metal takes place in the distant past, or in the relatively distant past, in the present moment right now in DC Comics, Batman is trying to figure out what's going on with, uh, with Nth Metal. And the cool thing about this is that we had seen things in the Forge, like the return of the Anti-Monitor Tower, basically, that we saw during Infinite Crisis. We don't know where it came from. We don't know how Batman got it. It's just there. And it was one of those huge reveals from, from Dark Days the Forge that was never really expanded on. Presumably, it'll be expanded on during the actual Dark Knight's Metal storyline. But for right now, we have no answers to that question. <laughs> but in his pursuit to figure out what's going on, he ends up catching up with Wonder Woman. Now, something to keep in mind here is that Wonder Woman makes reference to the idea that the gods have long since abandoned Earth because a war is coming. And that was covered in Greg Rucka's Wonder Woman, the idea that she's never been back to, to Themyscira. And all the times that Wonder Woman had left Themyscira and all the times that she had gone back to visit, she was never going there. You know, she was basically in her own mind. She was retreating into her own head. It was really the biggest reveal of the Greg Rucka run, essentially saying that she's been in the DC universe the entire time and was never able to go home. But one of the things about the idea with regards to these gods effectively abandoning humanity comes in the form of her, you know, presenting Batman with the last of the great weapons of the gods, which is basically a sword of Apollo, which, you know, is essentially just this weapon that's called the Sunblade, and it's wildly powerful in terms of what it can do, but we won't actually see it put to any good use. Instead, we transition over to the Joker. Now, remember, in Dark Days the Forge, the tail end of that story, the very, you know, last page reveal, was the idea that the Joker was still alive. But remember, following the events of Dark Side War, there's three Jokers out there, and we don't know which one this is, but it's one down 
and two to go. And so because of that, we know this is the Joker from like Endgame and from Death of the Family and so on and so forth. But a lot of people were asking the question when I was going through those early New 52 runs, which again, you'll find in that playlist that we have down in the description. A lot of people were asking the question, how did the Joker come back? If the Joker was basically dead, if the Joker had been killed off, how did he return? The great thing about this is that the Joker gives us this answer as part of, uh, you know, Scott Snyder's New 52 Batman run with the Court of Owls and different things like that. He introduced a substance called Dionysium and Dionysium was basically this liquid more or less that allowed people to tap into it and in turn either experience immortality or at the very least to prolong their lives. But how long their longevity lasted depended on how pure the Dionysium was. For someone like Vandal Savage, he had basically tasted of the Dionysium in its most pure form. For someone like the Joker, it's diluted. It's just kind of eroded over the ages or something along those lines. But the result is that the Joker is not truly immortal. Instead, the Dionysium served the purpose of basically engulfing the Joker's body and effectively healing him, allowing him to return. Now, the other half of this is also the character of Duke Thomas. And that's one of the big things that Scott Snyder has really just been kind of, you know, keeping on the back burner the entire time in All-Star Batman. Duke Thomas was a character who appeared all the way back during the events of uh, Endgame, but Endgame was basically the story was Duke Thomas's parents being forced to succumb to the exact same thing as Bruce Wayne's parents in the sense that the Joker basically took Duke Thomas and he kidnapped him and he took his parents and then he was going to have his parents killed by Joe Chill, the same person who killed Batman's parents. But the question was, why Duke Thomas? Why is Duke Thomas so special? Well, the Joker ends up answering that question here in a little bit. What we end up doing, <laughs> what we end up doing at the moment is we actually transition back over to Carter Hall. And again, this is just kind of an investigation, just kind of poking around, looking at all these different things that go on with regards to, you know, this investigation, trying to understand how it all works. And of course, using technology to his advantage and essentially opening this dimensional rift of sorts and peering in, all he sees on the other side is just darkness, death, a hunger, a desire to destroy all things. And that's what's kind of cool about this is because it's, it's Scott Snyder drawing on the nature of when you stare at the abyss, the abyss stares back. Then we end up seeing characters who are brought in like Dublex. When Batman transitions back over to the uh, Sonoran Desert in Arizona, he ends up running into Dublex. Well, as far as I'm aware, we haven't seen Dublex for quite some time, but he was originally a character, I believe, that was introduced in the 1970s by Jack Kirby, and he was just part of Project Cadmus, which at the time, and really, you know, sort of conti uh, continues to be this sort of scientific arm in the realm of DC Comics. But Dublex was basically a guy who was cloned using metahuman powers. And he's an incredible telepath and, you know, illusion caster. But the fact remains, you know, where he's effectively overcome by his inability to keep these illusions up, ultimately, once he collapses, we're basically revealed to Talia al Ghul. Now, why Talia al Ghul is here, we're not really given an in-depth explanation. All we're told is that somewhere along the line, Ra's al Ghul had access to an extremely powerful weapon, and he's been trying to get it back ever since. And the implication here is that the weapon that Ra's al Ghul had at one point is, in fact, the Sun Blade but it's not explicitly stated. It's just a weapon that existed somewhere along the line. And so what happens is that because this Sunblade is made of eighth metal, which seems to be a metal that's maybe weaker than nth metal, the higher the number, the more durable the material, we're not really told explicitly. But a trade is basically offered here in the sense that Batman offers up the Sunblade in response for the Dagger of Shazam. Now, this brings into, the, into question, where is Shazam? What is he doing? I keep seeing this question all the time in the comments. Everybody's asking, you, Rob, where's Shazam? Tell us where Shazam is. If, as if I somehow have secret super inside information on the comic book industry. But Shazam has only appeared one time in DC Rebirth, and that was for a couple pages in Hellblazer Rebirth in the first volume. And it's when John Constantine basically returns back to uh, back to New York, all hell breaks loose. Wonder Woman asks Shazam, should we get involved? And ultimately it's no, we'll just wait and we'll see what happens. If things pop off, we'll get involved. If not, we'll just let Constantine do his own thing. And that's the last time that we see him. Now, the important thing to keep in mind is that Jeff Johns, the guy who's basically spearheading the whole DC Rebirth thing, uh, did an interview during San Diego Comic-Con in 2016, I think it was, and he was asked the same question, where is Shazam? And the statement that he made is that Shazam will have a huge role to play, especially when it comes to the events of the Watchmen getting involved in the DC universe. At least I'm pretty sure that's what he said. So Shazam's not being written out. He's not being ignored. He's not being thrown on the back burner, never to be seen or heard from again. He's basically being held because he's going to have an extremely important role later on. But the idea is that
that, you know, the Joker effectively, you know, transitioning back to Duke and, and Green Lantern, the Joker starts tearing up this machine that Batman had built. But we didn't really know why. All we knew is that this machine was basically created during the events of Super Heavy, which was a Batman story arc that was done as part of Scott, uh, Scott Snyder's final run, the last little tidbits that he did before the whole events of uh, DC Rebirth kind of setting off. But all we really knew about this machine was that it was designed for the purpose to guarantee that there would always be a Batman, that Batman would be able to essentially come back if he ever were to die. Now, the other half of this is that the Joker is not playing the role of a bad guy here. He's not playing the role of a villain. And that's why this is so big, because remember, the Green Lantern, Hal Jordan, is not here of his own volition. He's not here because he was stumbling across Gotham City one day and said, I wonder what Batman's doing. He was sent here by the Guardians of the Universe. And so what this means is that whatever it is that's going on in this Batcave, whatever it is that Batman's doing, is big enough to draw the attention of the Guardians of the Universe, which is a pretty huge deal. Now, once, you know, Green Lantern is effectively taken out, or at least knocked out temporarily by the Joker, the Joker immediately turns his attention to Duke Thomas. And that's when we basically get this entire revamp of the concept of metahuman in the world of DC Comics. Because for years and years and years and years, metahumans, you know, basically evolved or arrived in DC Comics through one of two means. Either it was genetic or the powers were bestowed upon them. And that's a universal constant in the realm of comics. Either people are born with powers or powers are given to them. With regards to the Joker, in terms of how he relates to Duke Thomas, what he basically says is this. In the early days, you know, back at a point when technology wasn't nearly as advanced as it is right now, there wasn't the ability to easily say this person is a metahuman, that person is a metahuman. Instead, it was a very primitive system. It was a very primitive basis. The idea behind this was that when a person was basically born, there would be a test that would be done on them. But the only way to verify this was to send up a flag to basically say, yes, this person has powers, this person doesn't. But they were only given four letters that they could possibly use. And so instead of, you know, saying superpowers, you know, crazy abilities, telepath, telekinesis, or whatever, the four letters were M-E-T-A, meta. However, that's not what they were testing for. They were not testing for, for powers specifically. They were testing for the basis behind powers. What was being scanned for was metal. They were scanning for a particular substance in the blood of the person who was born. If that person had this metal in their veins, they would just put up a flag that says meta, which is short for metal. And so what this does, or at least what this means, is DC's essentially coming back and saying that the term metahuman derived from the fact that these individuals who were born with powers had this nth metal in their blood. And the result is that when they were born, this flag was sent up to indicate that. What it seems to be happening here is that anybody who's born of the earth, anybody who is not Superman or Wonder Woman or something along those lines, basically gains their abilities because they have nth metal in their blood. Now, what this also does is it introduces the notion of why people are able to gain powers. Take, for example, somebody like the Flash, Barry Allen. The Flash, Barry Allen, was not born with powers. He was not born with the ability to move extremely fast. But the question was always asked, how is that the Barry Allen was doused in chemicals and struck by lightning and not melted into sludge after it all happened. The answer that's being given here is nth metal. He had nth metal in his veins. And so because of that, instead of killing him, it gave him powers. Now, how this is gonna play out, we don't truly know. But what this does mean is it offers an explanation as to why people have abilities in the realm of DC Comics. What this also does is it presents the notion that if somebody can figure out a way to tap into that whole thing, they can in turn give people powers. And so that creates some pretty interesting scenarios because what happens if the Watchmen are fighting the Justice League and Rorschach has somehow managed to return from the dead and has a grudge against Dr. Manhattan. Well, here comes Batman injecting Rorschach with the powers of Superman. And suddenly, you've got Rorschach fighting Dr. Manhattan. And so again, there's all kinds of different things that could come out of this and all kinds of different scenarios that could unfold here. And so ultimately, what we end up having in the middle of this whole thing, where the Joker is able to, you know, temporarily subdue Duke, uh, Duke Thomas, only for, uh, you know, Hal Jordan to basically emerge here and to reveal, hey, look, I'm a pilot. You literally threw me into the hangar of Batman, you know, and more or less bring the Joker down. What's also being done here is it's revealing the fact that Duke Thomas himself is a metahuman. Duke Thomas has powers, and that's why the Joker chose him. The Joker started doing some investigation. He started, started doing some poking around. It tells us what the Joker was doing between the events of Batman uh, Death of the Family and Batman Endgame. That instead of just sitting around and trying to figure out a way to poison the Justice League with Joker toxin, that he was doing his homework. He was studying everything that was going on behind the scenes. And what he ended up coming to the realization of was that if Batman were able to basically use this machine and was able to tap into some other dimension or something along those lines, he would bring ruin to everything. And so in this story, the Joker's the good guy. 
That's the craziest thing about this. The Joker is the hero in this story because he's trying to stop Batman from engaging in universal calamity. Now, the other thing to keep in mind here is that Batman doesn't realize what it is that he's doing. He's not aware of the fact that he's engaging in universal calamity. In Batman's perspective, he's trying to figure out what in the world is going on here. And so ultimately what ends up happening is we basically have Duke Thomas manifesting his powers and essentially being given a name, the signal. And so what seems to be going on with regards to Duke is he can essentially take something that previously existed and then in turn show what it used to look like. The implication here is that he can see how things are supposed to work. And so of course with, with Hal Jordan giving him a lantern ring, in turn he's able to basically conjure a construct that represents or looks exactly the way the machine used to look. And so what this does is it'll, it allows Batman to basically get this machine together and start functioning and start using it and in turn peering into this interdimensional portal. Now of course the response that he gives is that there's nothing there. All he saw was darkness. And the cool thing about this is that we end up finding out at the end of the story that this darkness that Batman sees was designed to be that way. That there are these individuals whom we know nothing about and that we've never seen before who reside 3,000 miles below Gotham City, uh, who are basically under this pit of Dionysium far below the Batcave. And the implication here is that they basically forced Batman to see darkness. He didn't actually see them. He didn't see what was going on. And so what seems to have happened is that Batman peering into the darkness basically saw all these different versions of himself who were inherently evil and this father of all Batman which is to say the Batman that seems to have come before or something along those lines uh, ultimately Batman was kept from seeing that but that's what awaited him on the other side and so that's what Dark Knight Metal seems to be it's all of these invasions you know of all these evil alternatives to Batman himself and so again it's gonna be crazy <laughs> It's going to be absolutely bonkers. But if you guys are new here to Comics Explain, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like. And also, make sure that you check that description down there. That will have all the videos that you need to understand what's going on with Dark Knight's Metal. Something else that I want to point out here is that there is preludes to Dark Knight's Metal outside of this. There's like Teen Titans number 12, different things like that. Uh, those entire story arcs will just be thrown in there just because of the fact that I did full stories instead of like single issues or something along those lines. So you'll find all that stuff down there and that should be able to help you guys sort through everything and you know go through in chronological order in order to get prepped for Dark, Knight, uh, Dark Knight's Metal. But anyway guys, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end and I will catch you all later. Peace.